Hi, in this video we're going to talk about designing software with the N-layer design pattern. So this video is part of a course on web development with Java using the Spring Boot framework. My name is Shad Sluter and I work as a computer science professor at Grand Canyon University. So I welcome you to join me in class here. Please subscribe so you make sure that you don't miss any of the videos. So this is part of a course right now that is going to cover all of these subjects here. So N-layer design is used in many courses, but this one particularly is why I made the video. So if you're programming in C-sharp or JavaScript or Java or whatever your language, this will apply to you. So this picture here gives a basic idea of what N-layer architecture means. So the N means how many layers there are. So in this view, you can see that this is a three-layer architecture. Notice how many different servers there are in this thing. So when you're building an app, you're working on your own laptop and you're programming something that runs on a local host or whatever, it's pretty well localized to you. But we want to design software that will scale to multiple servers. And so this is a pretty common architecture that you see in many frameworks such as Spring Boot. So let's start at the right side here. So first of all, we assume that your application stores data somewhere, likely in a database, which is a server. This server here is the bottom layer or the right layer in this case. Then we have application servers, which are in the middle. This is where a lot of the logic of your program happens. And then we have the front end view, which is the web server. And you probably can guess that a web server is connecting to clients, which are web browsers. So let's talk about each of these ideas individually and then later in the other videos that follow this, we're going to design an application that literally is the full stack from right to left, or if you call it top to bottom, we're going to use all the layers and connect them. So first of all, let's talk about what the containers are and why we would separate them as we do. So the principle here is you should be designing your software so that each function or each class or each module or each component of your program has one job to do. It's the single job principle. So when we are splitting up an application into different layers, we are giving each layer one job to do. So splitting up the jobs according to layers is not only a good idea to make your program more readable, but it allows it to be more scalable too. So if we were to literally separate these layers into different servers, we may have four, five, we might have a hundred different servers that are all responsible to do different parts of an application. So when we're scaling on a large scale, we're talking about applications such as Amazon's web servers or Google's search engines or any commercial property that has millions of users and the servers are not capable by themselves in a single instance of doing such a large job. So that's where this N tier comes from. We're going to have multiple servers doing the lifting together, which means that if one component or one layer of our application begins to show a bottleneck and slows down, then we can add more resources at that point and we can alleviate the problem. Let's start here with a client layer. So a client is probably going to be a web browser, or it might be in the case of a mobile phone, it might be an app. Uh, there are desktop versions of your applications, of course, but usually when we talk about clients, we're talking about learning how to program in HTML and CSS as our primary focus of languages. In this layer, you should do a few jobs. Obviously, you have to render forms and display tables of data, but we also would think about the data itself and how we manage it. At this end of the layer, we are going to do minimal data validation. So this is a principle that says, in your data entry form, for instance, check to see if the phone number is in the correct format. We're going to be checking data at other layers down the road too, because we want to make sure that we don't trust the layer above us and we don't give garbage to the layer below us. And so at this layer, at the client layer, we're going to do some data validation on a minimal uh, scale. Now we're also going to try to keep the job here as only one task. What is the task of the client layer? Well, it's to show data. 
we should not have logic or processing or heavy lifting going on here for the CPU. So for example, let's say we have a tic-tac-toe game. The client is going to display X's and O's and maybe some buttons. But the idea of where the code goes that is supposed to figure out what move comes next or to check to see if the game was won or lost or even if a move was valid or not, those are all logic questions and they go in a different layer. The presentation layer is to take whatever was given to it from the previous layer and display it on the screen. So the client layer has one job to do, and that's to show things. Now, to create something that goes into the web browser, we need a web server to probably dynamically generate that code. Sure, you can create static websites, but most are generated on the fly as the user interacts with the application. So we're talking now about the web server or the presentation layer. So in this layer, we are going to have things like handlers, like click handlers, or form submit handlers, or scroll sensor events, you know, when you move a scroll bar, or some kind of a control. So whenever a user does an input, this presentation layer is going to receive that input, and it's going to send it on to the application. So in this case, Let's say we're dealing with a form that is called Hello World. And you can see that when there is a button click on this uh, event, we're going to show the words Hello World in a message box. So this is not a web front end here. We're talking about Win Forms. But the idea is that the form is going to have a click handler for this event. Now, some of the controls that you put into your web forms and other things have automatic data validation rules. So for instance, you can have a date input and there only there's only one way to put in a valid date here. You you can't write something incorrectly. You have to pick something from a list. And so a lot of data input controls have things like filters that will mask off phone numbers or zip codes or certain email addresses. And so your uh, data validation sometimes is done automatically for you depending on the controls you choose to put on your forms. Also, site navigation is going to be controlled here in the presentation layer. So you can see that the controller here is uh, responding to the URL called slash all. And uh, the event is called show all orders. So obviously, this is uh, trying to process some database. It goes to a service called order service and says, get me a list of all of these uh, orders that we have in the database. And then we're going to display them on a view called orders, which is a template that will create probably a table. And you can see everything in one list. So the presentation layer is able to handle pages and show different uh, forms and different tables and reports on the screen. Now, the presentation layer is probably going to be using this design pattern called MVC. So M stands for model, view, and controller. So the model is the class, such as a user class or a product class or some kind of an object that you're using in your store. And then the, the view is the HTML, that's the web page. And then the controller is this event in the center that does all of the responding to events that come from the uh, views. Now the next item up is the business layer, or this is sometimes called the service layer. Here's some examples of what a business service will do. These are all about the logic of your program. So, for instance, if you wonder where should I calculate a shopping cart and compute the tax and capture the, uh, the user's uh, shipping address. So all of this would go in a business layer. It would validate whether the person's credit card has been approved or not, and it would calculate all of the uh, hard parts. So cal calculating an interest on a loan is an example of something that you would do at the business layer or at the service layer. You might generate a graph and then it would generate maybe a JPEG or a GIF picture. And then that would be sent off to a view, which is the front end. So the business layer is doing the heavy lifting, CPU intensive kind of work here. So here's an example. Suppose we were creating a game and we had an artificial intelligent agent that was able to play chess. So the chess moves would be calculated in a service layer or in the business services. So we would either call it the business layer or the service layer. They're kind of used interchangeably when we deal with applications. Now at the bottom, we have the data access layer. 
And the only job for this layer is to talk to some kind of a data service. So the data service we're probably going to assume is a database. And SQL or MySQL are the first things that come to mind for a typical program. It doesn't have to be a database. It could be another service somewhere else. But the data access layer is the uh, layer that has the properties called create, read, update, and delete. The CRUD app. And so these functions are encapsulated in a single class that can do all of these events. So here's an example. If you wanted to create a good data access layer, you would have a class called data. And we might create a method called save person. So notice how compact this is. Very nice. Now there's another item that you're going to eventually have to execute, which is the SQL statement. We want to simplify it so we can just say data.savePerson rather than SQL execute and a whole bunch of stuff that goes with it. So the data access layer will talk to the database, of course, but we want to encapsulate and hide this, this data access from the upper layers. The upper layers just know that data comes its way. It doesn't know if it's coming from a SQL table or if it's coming from a text file or whatever. The data access layer is going to have very simple commands such as .savePerson. Now, in most frameworks, there's a feature called an ORM, which is an object uh, relational ma mapping. And this is the idea that you can take a object such as a person class. Let's say person has first name, last name, address, and so on. And uh, you define the class, and then the ORM will generate these uh, tables in the background for you that match perfectly with the field names of the table or the column names of the table that match directly to the properties of a class or an object. And so an ORM saves you a lot of coding in SQL terms. Now, um, in my courses, uh, probably not going to see much for ORMs. The uh, prevailing attitude in the university where I teach is that students should learn how to write SQL statements before they rely on these shortcuts. So even though ORMs might be popular where you work, uh, you're probably not going to see a lot of tutorials on how to use them in the, the things that I'm going to teach you. Here's some things to keep in mind when we're talking about N-layer software. So distributing an application across tiers helps manage the performance and the scalability and fault tolerance and security. So we can scale up by adding servers or taking them away if we don't need them. But the uh, ability to share the workload across multiple hardware is a great way to scale your app. Now, also to keep in mind, though, is you don't want to go overboard with too many encapsulations and interfaces between layers because that is really computationally expensive. So how much more? It's a thousand times, according to some sources I've seen, that it is a thousand times slower to make a call across to another service than to do it internally in the same process. And so you don't want to just do this willy-nilly. You want to make sure that there's a good reason for it. And if your server is on the other side of a network, or even worse, somewhere on the internet, the service times that are going to respond to your app are very, very slow indeed. So we should keep in mind then that we generally should use the tiers minimally and use them only when necessary. They're a necessary evil, but they are expensive to implement as far as computation is go. So let's talk about ways that you can implement the end tier structure. So this is the three-tier structure. You can see I have three physical servers. We have a database server, we have a web server, and in the middle we have this business service. And so depending on the needs, we can scale these up to be greater machines or smaller machines. And if there's a bottleneck, we can even add more at those layers. But you might not even need three layers. You might, for instance, be able to combine two different jobs in one server. We have a database server, he's all alone, but then we would have an application server and a web server about both on the same machine. And if you really want to get minimal, then you can have all of these uh, different jobs on one machine. So for instance, if you've ever done a tutorial, you've probably used MAMP as a development environment. And you notice when you say start servers, you always get two servers here. So you have an Apache server, which is a web server, and then you have a MySQL server, which of course is a database server. So the performance is great because you're the only person using the application. You're the, you're the application developer, you're the tester, but if your poor laptop had to serve a thousand people, it might not keep up so well. But an N-tier architecture doesn't necessarily mean that you have multiple servers. It just means that they could be separated 
if necessary. So just a reminder that this video is part of a larger course. So we're in part two, which is about the model views and controllers, and we're going to create an application that will actually implement these things. So if you want to become a software developer, make sure that you subscribe so you don't miss any of the videos that are upcoming, and come to class with me. Check out the other videos, whether it's Java or C Sharp or JavaScript or other languages. I want to help you become better at your career and advance your goals. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.